Hey everyone, welcome. Uh, my name's Reuven. I don't know how many of you were at the keynote this morning that Carol gave, but she set a goal for everyone to be a lifelong learner. Mission accomplished. Okay, um, what do I do? I teach Python and Pandas every day. I go to companies around the world and I help them, whether it's Python for non-programmers all the way up to advanced workshops, I have online courses, I have a newsletter called Bamboo Weekly. It's food for pandas and it's food for thought. Every week it's new puzzles about, I know, I know, get used to it folks, you got 30 minutes with me. And every week it's uh, new puzzles based on current events and real world data to improve your pandas fluency. I'm on YouTube, I've got some books, I've got Python workout with 200 exercises to improve your Python skills. And as of two months ago, I've got pandas workout with 200 exercises to improve your panda skills. So. Let's talk about dry, one of the most important ideas that I've encountered in programming. Um, don't repeat yourself. Don't repeat yourself. So the idea is if you have the same code in multiple lines, you should dry up that code, you should use a loop. And if you have the same code in multiple places in one program, then you should not repeat yourself, you should use a function. And if you have the same code in multiple programs, then don't repeat yourself, use a library. And in Python, of course, we call this a module or a package. And a module helps the future you, right? You don't have to implement it yourself again, but it also helps other people who might be solving the same problem. Well, that's where Pandas comes in. Don't reinvent the wheel when it comes to data analysis. Pandas does all the stuff that we need day after day. If you use Pandas, the hard stuff is done for you. Reading data from a huge variety of file formats cleaning it, analyzing it, visualizing it, writing it. Basically, Pandas is super duper convenient and that's why so many people use it. It's incredibly popular. And guess what? When Wes McKinney originally created Pandas, he relied on a package also. He relied on NumPy. NumPy is stable, it's fast, it handles 1D and 2D data, handles numerous data types, it's a great, great, um, sort of foundational infrastructure for doing exactly what Pandas wants to do. That's great. And I often make the analogy between a manual and automatic transmission, that basically NumPy is like the stick shift. It's low level, it gives you lots of control, but it doesn't have all the bells and whistles and frills and so forth, and you might destroy your clutch in the process. Whereas Pandas is high level, um, it gives you tons and tons of convenience methods, it's just really useful to use and fun to use, and you don't have to worry about all that low level stuff, even though maybe it's gonna be a little less efficient. And so we've got a Pandas series, but that's really a wrapper around a 1D NumPy array. And we've got a Pandas data frame, but that's really a wrapper around a 2D NumPy array. Or, if you prefer, we can think of it as a dictionary of Pandas series. So really, there's lots of good news there. NumPy storage is in C, so it's gonna be way faster than Python could do, and use way, way, way less memory than Python will as well. It uses vectorization, so just about anything I'm gonna do, I don't use a for loop, rather I just hand it to the system and it figures out how to do it for me. And it comes with lots of analysis methods. And as I said, it's used by many, many people, many, many projects, so we know it's stable, it's safe, and we just don't have to worry about it. Well, that's the good news. There is some bad news, folks, and one of them is that storing data in pandas via NumPy uses lots of memory, and we're gonna see in a bit just how much. Also, um, I heard, I don't know, 10 years ago, that people in the database world were talking about storing things in columns rather than rows. And I was like, really? What does that make a difference? So it turns out experts actually know what they're talking about. Mark that one down, folks. And basically, when you're doing transactions, it's very nice to have things in rows. You just add another row and another another. But when you're analyzing data, having it in columns is way faster and easier. And so when we want to do analysis of data, then having columnar storage is gonna be much faster. And so if NumPy is not doing that in columns, if it's doing it in rows, bad news. Also, we store all the data precisely as it is. There's no compression, there's no zero copy techniques, none of that stuff that people have designed over the last number of years, and we can't even batch or stream the data. It's either in memory or not. Oh yeah, and we might want some complex data in there as well. Strings, well yeah, NumPy does, use, does have strings in there. Don't use them. And so Pandas doesn't use them, Pandas uses Python strings, which are great, but they take up a lot of space and memory and on and on and on. 
dates and times also, maybe they're stored well, but we don't have a lot of convenience methods, not to mention nested types and so forth. So let's just get a sense of what's going on here. Um, one of my favorite data sets to use is New York City parking violations in 2020. There were a lot of people who had parking tickets then, and on disk, the CSV file is 2.2 gigabytes. So I'm gonna read it in, and when I do, I see that it's 12 and a half million rows. That's a lot of parking tickets, folks. So let's ask, let's ask Pandas, how much memory is this using? And it tells me, oh, it's using 4.0 plus gigabytes. You know what that plus means? That plus means it's lying to you, friends. It means I am not going to actually go see how much memory it's using. I'm just gonna stick with NumPy and see how much memory it's using. It's counting the sizes of the pointers, not of the strings themselves. Oh, so how can we convince it to like give us an accurate read? We tell it usage equals deep, and then we discover that, oh yeah, it's actually 15.6 gigabytes. But what's 11 gigabytes among friends? <laughs> so, so basically, Arrow, Arrow is an Apache open source project that's trying to be dry for data, that we can all use it and then not have to worry about these problems. It allows many languages and frameworks to work with 2D data. And the idea was basically, what if we had one library that everyone could rely on? No one has to reinvent the wheel. We will use columns rather than rows for the storage and we'll have faster retrieval and analysis will reduce the overhead of moving data across different languages and systems, and we can take advantage of some of the technologies that are in modern price processors. Now, Arrow was first released in 2016. The latest version came out nearly a year ago, version 13 in August 2023. It is a stable project, it's a useful project, and a good number of languages and frameworks are using it, including Python. We have PyArrow. Right, and so this is Python bindings for Arrow, and you can use it in your programs. You can create arrays, you can create tables, you can retrieve particular rows and columns, you can do sorting, you can do grouping. It really gives you the, the basic infrastructure you want. And it has, of course, a whole bunch of data types that we'll want to use, which will seem very familiar to anyone who has used pandas. We have integers and floats and dates and times and strings. And then it even has dictionaries, which confusingly are like pandas categories, and it has maps, which confusingly are like Python dictionaries. Sure, sure. Um, it's, it's good for the training business, so I can't complain. And basically, complex types also. So we have arrays, which are like a pandas series, and we have tables, which are like a pandas data frame. To which we might say, so what? And so this is why I'm calling it the Pi Arrow revolution, because Pandas is moving to adopt PyArrow in place of, or at least as a first-class substitute for NumPy. Some of that functionality is already here, and much more is coming down the pike, and we should be ready for it. Using PyArrow can already save you time and memory, and down the road, it's gonna save you a lot of time and memory. And get ready, because it will be required in Pandas 3.0. Okay, so let's divide this revolution into multiple parts. The first part is faster CSV reading and writing. And we use lots of CSV files. And CSV is, like, when I started doing data stuff, I was like, well, clearly there are some very, very sophisticated file formats out there that we use. And I discovered, ha ha, no, no, actually we use CSV, which has no real serious specification. And that's why read CSV has a crazy number of parameters, because there's a crazy number of different ways that you can read and write CSV files. Okay, so read CSV, very flexible, and it works. Oh yeah, it can also be very slow, because what is it doing? It's reading a text file and then figuring out column by column, should this be an int, should this be a float, or should I just say whatever and call it a string? And that takes time. So we can speed it up by specifying the D types. We can also speed it up by saying, listen, don't chunk it. Don't take several thousand rows at a time and estimate based on those, because you might get a mismatch, and then it will complain with a warning. So we can say low memory equals false, read the whole thing into memory at the same time, and then it'll make that estimate more uh, appropriately. But regardless of what we do and how we do it, it's still going to be pretty slow. And the solution is here today, folks. It's use PyArrow for reading and writing CSV files. And how? You say engine equals PyArrow, and it's done for you. This comes with pandas. Well, how much faster is this? Well, my, my big uh, file takes a long time to load, so I was gonna use time it, but like, 
you know, I wanted to have it finished before I retire. So instead, I wrote a quick function that just says starting time, ending time, and we'll do, do that. So my first function here is load with time. Uh, we're just gonna sort of load up, we're gonna count how long did it take to load up this CSV file. I'm gonna say low memory equals false, great, and then we'll print out how much time it took. Um, and then I have a second function which is almost identical, pi arrow load with time, and it's gonna load it, but as I said, it's gonna say now engine equals pi arrow. So how much less time does this take? So load with time takes 69.12 seconds, over a minute to load this file. Whereas pi arrow takes 13 seconds. That's a big difference, right? It's five times faster. So does it make, like, who cares about anything else, right? Like, that's amazing. Um, and by the way, if you try to use low memory equals false, it'll say you can't do that. Like, it, it doesn't make sense to use it with Pi Arrow, and so if that's your engine, it'll give you, it'll give you an error message. Um, I should add, Pi Arrow is usually pretty smart about detecting date time columns. Sometimes, though, it just doesn't. It's kind of weird. I can't figure out why, but most of the time it'll do it, and that means you don't have to specify date parse or parse dates equals blah, blah, blah for the columns. But some CSV files seem to be a little too weird for Pi Arrow, um, and if the file is small, then who cares, right? This is really something we care about if our data is larger. And you can do this today, and I nowadays, just about all the time, um, unless I'm doing an intro course where I haven't talked about this yet, I'll just use Pi Arrow for loading things on my own because it's just so much faster. And when it works, which is most of the time, it's great. Okay, Pi Arrow Revolution Part 2, faster file formats. So what formats do we use? Well, we've already talked a little bit about CSV, but we also have Excel. And the good news with Excel files, and yes, there is some good news with Excel files, they are coded in binary, meaning we know what data types we have. There's none of this guesswork that comes with CSV of, well, it looks like integers, no, no, no. We know that there are ints, we know there are floats, we know there are dates, it comes in pretty well, but it is super, super slow. And so Arrow defined two new binary file types, Feather and Parquet. Um, and so Feather, and I think it's pronounced Parquet, this is what happens when you learn things from reading. Anyway, um, so Feather is faster at reading and writing, but it's not compressed. And Parquet is slower at reading and writing, typically, not always, and it's highly compressed. So you basically have a, 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 like a trade-off between space and time. So given my same data of 2.2 gigabytes for all those parking tickets, what does the difference look like? And this is what it looks like. Feather is about half the size there, and Parquet is way, way, way smaller. It turns out like they're, they're faster to load, and these are binary formats, no guesswork. So as soon as they're loaded into pandas, we know what D-type they have, and they can be sophisticated D-types. You want to have an int 8, you want to have an unsigned float 16, actually, unsigned int 16, not going to have unsigned floats, but like basically you can do it, you can do strings, all sorts of different types, they are right there. And the nice thing is also when you write it out to one of these file formats, other systems can read them in and they'll get those same types and they know what to do with them. Well, how about the timing? How long does it take to read them? A lot less time, right? So CSV with the Python engine um, took, in this case, 55 seconds. The Pi Arrow engine, about 11 seconds, so still about a five times difference. Feather was less, Parquet was even less. So you will definitely be saving time and you'll get it more accurate if you use these file formats. Now, you might say, yeah, but no one is giving me data in these formats. So first, have you considered finding better friends? But second of all, <laughs> what you can do is you can read in the CSV file and then store it out into Feather Parquet, and then the next time you want to read it in, it'll be available faster, better, and so on and so forth. So it's like, read it in once in CSV, store it in Parquet or Feather, and then you never have to think about it again. But what a lot of people are talking about and thinking about when we think about this PyO revolution is swapping out NumPy. And this is really big, or it will be. It's marked as experimental. If you look in the documentation, it says yes, and we'll talk about this more in a moment. Yes, you can set the D-type backend to be Pi Arrow, but it says this is experimental, which means if it breaks your project at work, um, like don't complain to them, but your boss will complain to you. So it will take time for this to work, but it's clearly the direction. So how do we do this? Well, one way is when we create a series or when we create a data frame, just specify a pi arrow d-type, and typically that's gonna be the name of the d-type that we're used to, plus square brackets pi arrow. So I create a series with random integers and an index, and then I say d-type equals in 64 square brackets pi arrow. Once I do that, the backend is in pi arrow, it is not in numpy. 
I can do that with a data frame, although when you specify the D type to a data frame like this, all the columns need to be the same type, so all these will be in 64, but fine, like for our purposes, that's okay right now. Well, what if you have a data frame and the data frame contains a column that you would like to convert to Pyro? Well, you can do that. So let's take, for example, from our parking tickets data set, the vehicle color. So first of all, let's find out how much memory this is using. So this one column is using 635 megabytes. Okay, and then I say, Vehicle color equals vehicle color as type. I can always use as type in pandas to get back a new series based on the old one and change the D type or get a new D type. And here I specify, oh yeah, the D type should be strings of pi arrow. I do that and the memory usage goes down a little. And by a little, I mean a ton, <laughs> right? It's 80% smaller for exactly the same data because it's not being stored in Python anymore. It's being stored in pi arrow in its special format and it knows how to do this and doesn't need all the overhead of Python strings. Well, what if I have a CSV and I want to read it into Pyro? Sure. So we say engine equals Pyro. You actually don't need to do that, but like, really? And then you say D type backend equals Pyro. And now all the backend is going to be in Pyro types as opposed to NumPy types, as you can very clearly see here. All right, maybe it's a very, very wide data frame with lots of columns. So I'll just like use DF info and I will summarize. And the summary is that we have 15 columns that are in 64 in Pyro, three columns that are null in Pyro, and 25 that are string in Pyro. Wait, 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 null in Pyro? What the heck is that? <laughs> so it turns out that this column hydrant violation, if we check, we say is NA and then value counts, tell me what percentage of this column is NA, is NAN? And the answer is 100% of it. And so if it's 100%, PyArrow says, oh, well, if all of them are NAN, I'm just gonna set it to be this special NAN type. I'm not gonna take up precious memory and space on an integer that will never actually be used. So it's smart enough when it does the analysis to do that. And the memory usage of this same data, which was originally 15 gigs, is now 3.7 gigs. That's a pretty significant savings, I think we can agree. Okay, but what people really want to know is not just how much memory it uses, how fast is it? So, let's say I want to get the top five values in a column. All right, so I'm just going to say vehicle color, value counts, head five. So show me the top five colors of cars, and we can see then that if we do that in NumPy, it takes us 510 milliseconds. If we do it in Pi Arrow, it takes 188 milliseconds. And here, for all these purposes, blue is going to be NumPy on the left, and red is going to be Pi Arrow on the right. We can see Pi Arrow is dramatically faster. What about searching for strings with regular expressions? Well, you can see that NumPy loves regular expressions as much as most people I know. Basically, it takes a long time to process it, and Pi Arrow's like, oh yeah, sure, whatever. And this comes back to, we're processing strings, and the strings are right there. We don't need to go out to uh, Python each time. What if I search with strings and like I do something a little uh, fancier. Oh, actually, this is the same thing. Oh, no, six times faster, there you go. What about, what are the most common states with blue cars? Something I'm sure that you've always wanted to know. Right, so basically, that's gonna take 912 milliseconds in NumPy and 87 in Pi Arrow. It's about 10 times faster, right? It's just a dramatic difference. So that raises the question, is Pi Arrow always faster? The answer is definitely not. What if I try getting some date information here? Let's find out in what months did people get their parking tickets? How many parking tickets per month? And it turns out that Pi Arrow is actually a little bit slower, about 30% slower here. What about if I want to find out what, like, how many parking tickets were in March and July? Again, Pi Arrow is a little bit slower here. So it's not a panacea. What about grouping? Yeah, I can group things. Oops, I can group things, but I can't. Flick things. Um, basically, we see that once again, pi arrow takes less time, about 30% less time if we're grouping by a column, and then we get the mean of the feet from the curb that the person was parked. By the way, I also did this with two columns, like a two column group, and it was almost exactly the same number. So there's no huge advantage or disadvantage there. Remember what I said before about column storage versus uh, row storage? So what if I try to retrieve rows? What if I use here dot iloc, to retrieve from position 0, 100, 100,000, and minus 10,000. Well, it takes 126 microseconds with NumPy, and it takes, yeah, 816 milliseconds with Pi Arrow. Um, that's a lot more. By the way, let me just demonstrate that on a graph. 
<laughs> um, yeah. And by the way, if you're thinking, oh, well, who would use .ilock? I'm going to use .lock. And the thing is, if we use .lock, it's the same thing, right? And .lock is always going to be slower because it uses the more flexible uh, um, things that we can use there. So, okay, now what? And right, just to like emphasize this, so you, you, it's very, very clear. Oh, I got the, yeah. So 789 milliseconds is 789,000 microseconds, right? Like just for those of you who are a little past like, you know, advanced math. What about joining, right? It's pretty common to join just like we do in SQL. So we can see actually that once again, pi arrow is much faster at join, no, that's faster, yeah, like half the time in terms of joining. Here I did a self-join on the data set. So I purposely sort of tortured the data set here, where it was like this incredibly large data set. I said, oh, just self-join on yourself, making this incredibly wide uh, uh, data frame. But like, you know, it's still, Pi Arrow did it much, much faster, much more easily. So let's just take all these things together. We can see that overall, NumPy, the blue line, definitely takes longer most of the time than Pi Arrow. But it's not a 100% win. There are definitely many cases in which pi arrow will take longer, and especially once you start dealing with rows, that's just like it blows up. Also, using pi arrow brings in new and different behavior. So do they want to recognize this problem? I'm going to create a series with integers, and it's int64. And then I'm going to set one of those to be nan. And now I look at my series, and well, nan is there, yes, and the d-type is float64. Why is it float64? Because nan is a float. It cannot be coerced into an integer. And so the only way that pandas can deal with this is to say, OK, I'm just going to turn the entire series into a float one. Well, let's do this with pi arrow now. I set it up with in64 pi arrow, pi arrow and pnan, and the type remains in64 pi arrow. And we have this other thing, na. NA is the pandas replacement for NAN. It is a higher level data type that works across many different types. And so if you have what's known as a nullable type, as integers in pi arrow are, as all things in pi arrow are, you don't need to move things into floats just to satisfy the madness of NAN. Now, it's not just in integers. What if I have strings here? So I'm going to create a series here. Hello out there with string pi arrow. I set one of them to be nan, and once again, I get na, and the d-type remains string. So I can remain in whatever domain I want with whatever d-types I want and not worry about it. Here's a fun one, overflow behavior. So I'm going to set my series here to be 10, 70, and 100, and I'm using int 8. Int 8, signed integers, so from minus 128 to plus 127. And then I'm going to say, let's add 100 to that. Well, that's fine, because 100 plus 10 is 110, 100 plus 70 is minus 86, and 100 plus 100 is minus 56. What's not to love? Oh, yeah, that's probably not the set of answers we wanted. And the fact that it doesn't give us any warnings, doesn't give us any errors, it's like a problem. By the way, what happens if I say S of NP plus 1,000? And as of NumPy 2.0, which came out just a few weeks ago, it will actually give us an error, an overflow error. It says, hey, this number that you're trying to add to the series is beyond the bounds of the d-type. What do you want from me? I'm giving up. By the way, in previous versions, it would give all sorts of different, whoop, different kooky answers depending on all sorts of stuff. But it was never good. And so if we use pi arrow, this problem goes away. So if we say now that our d-type is int 8 pi arrow, and now I add 100 to it, fine. And look at this, it was promoted automatically to in 64. That's what we would want. Now, there is a downside to this, right? What if you have a billion rows and suddenly they're promoted from int 8 to in 64? Now, instead of 8 gigs, you have 64 gigs. OK, well, so either it works great or you get a new gig. <laughs> OK. Um, what if, what about overflowing like this? No, this works just fine, right? It gets promoted right away to in 64 as we would sort of hope and expect. Basically, the key thing is here, we're not gonna lose our data. It's not gonna magically disappear some of our values. It might blow up our memory, but in some ways that's a better problem than just like getting wacky results. Now, you might have heard of extension types in pandas, and extension types have been around for a little while, and they are nullable. They allow us to use NA instead of um, NAN and thus not force them. 
And that is their advantage. But otherwise, they are pandas wrappers around the same NumPy types. So they're still row-oriented. They're still using Python strings. There's still no compression. They're still not interoperable with other uh, systems. Like, that's just like, so, so the extension types are better in one way than the regular NumPy types, but they're not that much better. And certainly, there's no comparison between the advantages of PyArrow and the extension types. But it does mean that you now have three different back ends that you can consider and weigh um, when you're trying to deal with this sort of data stuff. By the way, can you use raw PyArrow? Sure. Right, like, you know, PyArrow is a perfectly fine, reasonable, good library that if you want to, you can work directly with it. If you want that low level approach, you're not gonna get all the pandas functionality, but maybe you just wanna store and retrieve data. So that's okay. So you can use it. And then if and when you want, you can say, hey, PyArrow table, give me a data frame with your information. and It'll return a data frame. So this is a good way to create a data frame. And what if you want to do the opposite? For example, let's say you're just working with pandas, regular panda stuff, and you want to put it into a, a PyRO table so that other uh, uh, software can use it. Sure. You say PA, that's the standard abbreviation for PyRO, table from pandas, and just slurps up the data frame and gives it to you. Now, here's a fun one. When we use PyRO as our D type backend, and we say, hey, series, not to be confused with hey, Siri, hey, series, give me your values, it will give us a PyRO array. Fantastic. If I say, column, give me your values, it'll give me a pi arrow array. And if I say, data frame, give me your values, it gives me a numpy array. What? <laughs> and it turns out that this was done because so many software systems depend on getting that numpy array back that they didn't want to break compatibility. So this is a real revolution in, in pandas, but I think it's an even bigger one than just pi arrow. Right now, Pandas is a very powerful package. It allows us to dry up our code, do all sorts of things, really concentrate on solving our problems as opposed to solving solved problems. But I see Pandas as becoming not just a package, but a platform. Basically, we're now we're moving into having swappable backends. I can even imagine, and it's very easy for me to say this and hard for people to do this, one day we might have all sorts of backends that we can choose from, right? We might have distributed systems that are inside of a data, uh, you know, a data type that we can use there. Once this happens, sort of, you know, the world's our, world's our oyster. It's also setting the standard in many ways for an API for data analysis. So even Polars, which is competing with pandas in many ways is saying, oh yeah, it's easy to use what we do because we mostly implement the pandas API. And it's even something that other software systems can hook into and use. So not only PyArrow um, and Apache Spark and R, but DuckDB can basically sit in your process and read from and write to pandas data frames. So you have pandas like underneath, I keep doing that, pandas underneath is swapping out, and the things above it are doing that as well. So basically, PyRO, I really think, is revolutionizing pandas. You can get faster file reading and writing today, better, more efficient, back in storage tomorrow. You can try it today, give it a shot. Pandas is becoming a platform, and you will, I think, eventually be able to choose how much you want to trade off in terms of simplicity and, uh, versus efficiency. And we will have a growing number of options to work on that. All right, I think we have time for Q&A. Thanks very much. So um, we only have two minutes for question and answer, but if you have, have a question, please come forward to the stage. Hey. Uh, oh, this works. Great talk. <laughs> Thanks, Ruben. Um, now, Pandas is uh, like uh, normally is row based, and often I run into problems where I have to import European currencies, like from Germany and from Spain, where the comma is a thousand delimiter. So what I usually do is I import a string and then do a row based approach of mapping the A to F localized function. Does Pi Arrow, if it's column based, offer something that? faster allows to import number formats that have strange thousand delimiters or comma delimiters? I don't think so. I don't think so, but um, it, when I first started playing with Pyro and Pandas about a year ago, a little more than a year ago, not all of the Panda string functionality was there. It would basically blow up and you would say, oh yeah, we haven't implemented that yet. So far as I can tell now, all the dot .str functionality is there and it works pretty fast from what I've played with. So you should be able to import those as strings use some sort of search and replace to get rid of the you know, get rid of the commas and then do an as type and turn it into integers or into floats 
and that should still work faster. I wouldn't be surprised if that combination works faster than bringing it in with NumPy and playing with it in that way. Thanks. So I noticed on one of your slides, um, there's an integer that turns into a NAND because we didn't have any examples show up. So what I was wondering is, how would you recommend adding schema checking for something like that or ensuring that a function that uses that column or uses that result downstream doesn't get broken by the integer turning into a NAND or a NA? Well, so first of all, if you're doing like commercial usage, um, and not just playing around with things at home, then yeah, probably having some sort of type checking or checking on that is not a bad idea to make sure things don't blow up. But NAN is one of these things, or NA as we're now moving toward in the you know, Pandas world, is one of these things that like, you just sort of have to accept exists, and you need to, as part of your pipeline, be cleaning it out, like either replacing it or removing it, or you, you have to make a decision somewhere. So it's probably not a bad idea to have some sort of schema checking down the line, but that should be like a last resort rather than like to, to like an escape hatch just in case things went awry. Before that, I would say you want to like decide what you're going to do, including just removing them. Um, but you can interpolate, you can like, there, there's lots of options for that. There, there is with NAN no one good answer, and there are often multiple bad answers. Um, <laughs> so, so yeah, that, that's, that's my quick take. Cool, thank you. Hey, uh, thanks for the talk. Um, I may have missed the answer to this, but because the cost of doing lock and iLock lookups looks so much greater with PyArrow, if PyArrow is going to be the kind of de facto backend, what's going to happen to kind of make sure the API is stable in terms of the costs of doing those operations when migrating to the, the new Panthers version? So that's a very good question. I was in touch with, I don't remember who, on like the Pandas team more than a year ago, and I asked about like some things, and basically the answer was, like this is why it's experimental. We're still working on getting these things up to snuff. Um, I don't know quite what they'll do or how they'll do it, but I have to imagine that this sort of ridiculous disparity um, is something that's on their radar and they plan to fix. How exactly, I'm not sure, but I, I can't imagine otherwise. Hi, great talk. Uh, regarding the overflow example that you had, uh, can, uh, can I uh, use PyArrow uh, in that context to specify that any kind of overflow should be checked so that it returns a back overflow exception? So Not as far as I know. Um, I could be wrong. I've never seen anything in Pandas to say, basically, when I broadcast an operation, if it's going to promote or overflow, give me a warning, give me an error. Um, mm -hmm. I think, I mean, again, I would love for that to be the case and for me just not to know it. Like, as I tell people all the time, Pandas is so vast, there's no chance that I know all of it or even close to all of it, but I, I don't think so. Yeah, because the reasoning is that uh, if I specify that something is int 8, I really want it to be so. so, so. The second question is uh, regarding the uh, size optimizations, which is really great. Uh, does this also apply to custom classes? Sometimes I have pandas, uh, pandas tables that have uh, in, in its columns uh, my custom classes. So can it? No, no, like the moment that you're dealing with like Python objects, then mm -hmm. PyArrow, like, like pandas now with NumPy, will just have a pointer to your object in Python space. Now, if you can rewrite your class, haha, to be in some sort of like high arrow format nested, nested uh, data type, then I guess you could do it. But if you're just like storing Python classes in there, I, I don't see any advantage. Okay, thank you. Sure. Hello. At the beginning, you were talking about reading CSV files. Um, do you have any insight into why PyArrow is so much faster than um, Pandas original NumPy backend? So I think first of all, um, like it's written in C. I'm pretty sure it's written in C, which gives it like a fair amount of speed. Mm -hmm. um, I know that they do some multi-threading in there, but I'm not sure exactly. Like I, I tried to research it to get a straight answer on it, and it wasn't 100% clear to me whether it automatically does multi-threading if you have to specify it somehow. But I'm pretty sure that's being done. Like it's sort of splitting up the file and giving different cores different threads. I think that's what's going on. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, that, that, those are my best guesses but I don't know for sure. Okay, thank you. 
Um, okay, so uh, thank you for the questions and thank you for the very insightful talk. And as a token of appreciation, he wants to give this to you. Wow, thank you. And um, officially the session is over and the next scheduled session will be at um, 3.30. So see you again later. Thank you.